In 1991, a newly designed all-wheel drive system is available on the Dodge Caravan and Plymouth Voyager. This full-time all-wheel drive system distributes torque to the front and rear wheels, improving traction, handling, and stability. The all-wheel drive option is available on both the long and short wheelbase Chrysler minivan with the 3.3-liter engine, a modified A604 electronic four-speed automatic transaxle, and 15-inch wheels. Hello, and welcome to the November 1990 edition of MasterTech. The minivan on-road all-wheel drive system is a traction system designed to operate with no driver input and additional driving skills are not required. It provides extra safety and security when driving under most conditions. The primary benefit of all-wheel drive is improved traction, which results in superior straight-line acceleration and cornering on all types of road surfaces. The improved traction of all-wheel drive is also effective on wet, slippery surfaces. In order to drive the rear wheels, torque is provided from the transaxle to a power transfer unit, propeller shaft, rear driveline module, and two rear half shafts. The rear driveline module includes a viscous coupling, a rear torque tube assembly, vacuum actuation system, dog clutch, overrunning clutch, and the rear carrier assembly. Torque to the front wheels is provided the same way as on a front wheel drive system, directly from the transaxle. The key to the system is the viscous coupling, which allows for variable torque split between the front and rear wheels, depending on the rotational speed differences. During normal driving, power distribution to the rear wheels ranges from 8% in straight line constant speed up to 40% under wide open throttle acceleration on dry pavement. When the front wheels start to lose traction, the viscous coupling distributes more torque to the rear wheels to reduce the speed difference. This allows the vehicle to regain traction sooner than vehicles equipped with conventional two wheel drive. In the following section, We'll talk about each of the driveline components. Following that, we'll be looking at some of the design changes required to incorporate the all-wheel drive system into the front-wheel drive vehicle. Finally, we'll discuss all-wheel drive system service. In order to provide torque to the rear axle, the A604 transaxle had to be modified. A power transfer unit is attached to the right side of the transaxle, where the differential extension would normally be located on a front-wheel drive vehicle. The power transfer unit has a hypoid ring gear and pinion in which the ring gear drives the pinion. This provides a 90-degree turn from the transaxle to the rear output shaft of the power transfer unit. Because of the addition of the power transfer unit, the speedometer pinion assembly mounts to the power transfer unit instead of the differential extension housing. Power to the left front wheel is provided through the left side of the transaxle, the same as a front wheel drive vehicle. The left half shaft is also the same. The right front half shaft is new and unique to the all wheel drive system. The shaft has a long inner joint stub that passes through the power transfer unit into the differential side gear. There are two types of half shafts. One type for vehicles with and one for vehicles without four wheel anti-lock brakes. Notice the tone wheel on the half shaft for ABS vehicles. The right and left half shafts include two constant velocity or CV joints. The inner CV joints are plunging tripod type. The outer CV joints are Rezepa type. An open tubular propeller shaft transmits torque from the power transfer unit's rear output shaft to the viscous coupling, and different propeller shafts are used in short and long wheelbase minivans. 
At the forward end of the propeller shaft is a plunging tripod type CV joint. This type of CV joint allows for backward and forward movement of the engine, transaxle, and power transfer unit assembly and shaft pivoting caused by engine roll. A plunging tripod type CV joint eliminates the use of a slip spline at the rear output shaft of the power transfer unit. A slipped spline could lock up inside the rear output shaft during excessive engine roll. At the rear of the propeller shaft is a fixed tripod type CV joint. The propeller shaft provides torque to the rear driveline module, which includes the viscous coupling, rear torque tube assembly, vacuum actuation system, dog clutch, overrunning clutch, and the rear carrier assembly. As we said earlier, the viscous coupling is a device which transfers torque to the rear of the vehicle when the front wheels are slipping. The viscous coupling also allows for slight differences in front and rear wheel speeds. A viscous coupling consists of two sets of plates which are splined to a two-part shaft assembly. The outer plates are splined to the outer hub of the viscous coupling which is driven by the prop shaft. The inner plates are splined to the torque shaft and provide torque to the rear driveline components. Within the housing of the viscous coupling, the outer and inner plates are arranged alternately. The inner plates have spacer rings set between them on the inner edge in order to separate them. The outer plates have no spacer rings and they can slide along the splined shaft between the outer plates. The plates are separated by a special silicone fluid. The holes in the plates allow the silicone fluid to flow through and to move with both inner and outer plates. When the input and output of the viscous coupling are moving at the same speed, the plates are moving at the same speed and the viscous coupling does not differentiate torque. But when one set of plates begins to move at a higher speed than the other set of plates, the silicone fluid exerts force on the slower moving plates to reduce the speed difference between the plates. Under extreme conditions, the temperature of the silicone fluid rises. When this occurs, the fluid expands, forcing the plates to lock together. It eliminates any rotational speed differences and maximizes traction under slippery conditions. When the speed difference no longer exists, the temperature of the silicone fluid drops and normal function is restored. This locking and unlocking of the viscous coupling has been termed humping. A rigid torque tube assembly is attached between the viscous coupling and the overrunning clutch housing. This assembly contains the rear torque shaft, which transmits torque from the viscous coupling to the overrunning clutch. The overrunning clutch is a conventional Sprague type clutch. When torque is provided from the power transfer unit in the forward direction, the overrunning clutch engages and drives the rear axle. Under hard braking, when the front axle slows or stops turning, the Sprague clutch overruns to prevent feedback of front wheel braking torque to the rear wheels. This allows the rear wheels to continue turning to avoid loss of stability. The overrunning clutch assembly includes an axially sliding jaw or dog clutch, which provides all wheel drive in reverse, bypassing the overrunning clutch. The dog clutch is operated by a vacuum motor and double acting shift fork using manifold vacuum as its power source. Vacuum is routed from the top of the center vacuum pickup on the back of the manifold through a vacuum hose to a steel vacuum line which runs along the left rail and across the front fuel tank cross member. It connects to a hose which leads to the vacuum actuation system. The vacuum actuation system includes a vacuum reservoir and dual solenoid assembly, 
which are attached to the top of the torque tube. The reservoir stores manifold vacuum until it's routed by the solenoids to the vacuum motor. The vacuum solenoids for the dog clutch are actuated by the backup lamp switch circuit. A spring in the overrunning clutch housing cover disengages the dog clutch if vacuum is lost. When park, neutral, or any forward gear is selected, the solenoids are de-energized. Vacuum is applied to the forward side of the vacuum motor and atmospheric pressure to the rearward side, extending the shift fork into the overrunning position. When reverse is selected, the solenoids are energized and vacuum is applied to the rearward side of the vacuum motor and atmospheric pressure to the forward side, retracting the shift fork into the locked up position. Torque is transmitted from the overrunning clutch housing to the rear carrier assembly containing a pinion, which drives a ring gear. This ring gear provides torque to a conventional open differential, which drives the two rear half shafts. The rear half shafts transfer torque from the rear differential to the rear wheels. Both inner and outer CV joints are plunging tripod type. Different half shafts are used for ABS and non-ABS brake systems. The rear wheel bearings for the all-wheel drive minivan are hub unit three type, similar in concept to the front wheel bearings. Those are the driveline components of the minivan all-wheel drive system. Now, let's take a look at some of the other changes that were necessary in the design of the all-wheel drive minivan. There were many changes necessary in addition to driveline changes to incorporate the all-wheel drive system into the front-wheel drive vehicle. As a result, the underside of the all-wheel drive and front-wheel drive minivans include many different components. These changes can be found in the brake, suspension, chassis, fuel, and exhaust systems. The front cross member or K member is redesigned and a suspension bridge added to provide clearance for the power transfer unit output shaft and to strengthen the K-member. Because of this suspension bridge, the steering gear has been raised. A bobble strut controls movement of the power transfer unit relative to the K-member. New steering knuckles raise the vehicle one half inch and provide attachment to the raised steering tie rods. Besides being different for all-wheel drive and front-wheel drive, the steering knuckles are different for ABS and non-ABS brakes as well. Engine side mounts have been modified due to the increase in weight and change in engine movement. And front engine mounts are modified to provide vertical adjustment required for proper location of the power transfer unit output shaft within the suspension bridge. The front struts and rear shocks have been recalibrated and higher rate springs are used. New rear drum brakes are used to accommodate rear wheel drive and the brake hoses and parking brake cable have been modified. A new rear axle accommodates the rear wheel driving components and the rear leaf springs and hangers are unique. The rear jounce bumper has also been modified. A plastic 18 gallon fuel tank is mounted forward of the rear axle and a bolt in fuel tank cross member has been added. An exhaust system was designed for each wheelbase and the spare tire was relocated under the rear seat to accommodate the short wheelbase exhaust system. Heat shields were also redesigned for the all-wheel drive vehicle. Because of the many differences between the all-wheel drive and front-wheel drive minivan, be sure to specify front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive when ordering replacement parts for a 1991 minivan.
Most of the components in the all-wheel drive system are serviceable to some extent. Service of the power transfer unit is limited to the seals, seal joints, and one ball-type bearing. If the case cover, ring gear, pinion, tapered roller bearings, or pinion carrier fail, the entire power transfer unit must be replaced. The limited serviceability is due to difficult shim selection procedures required for proper bearing preload. The left front half shaft is carried over from the front wheel drive system. The CV joints can be serviced separately. The right front half shaft is also serviceable. However, you must be particularly careful when installing the half shaft. The extended stub of the half shaft must be inserted through the power transfer unit until it contacts the differential pin in the transaxle. Do not allow the shaft to pivot too far because damage to the inner CV joint boot could occur. A delicate seal on the right side of the power transfer unit can also be easily damaged if the shaft is incorrectly installed. Like the left front half shaft, the CV joints on the right front half shaft can be serviced separately. The propeller shaft is replaceable as a unit along with its CV joints. The propeller shaft CV joints cannot be serviced separately. The shaft has flanged ends which should be clean of debris and damage free before installation. Alignment marks are provided on the flanges. The propeller shaft plunging CV joint end should be inserted into the power transfer unit output flange first and retained with a hand tightened bolt. The fixed joint end should then be attached to the viscous coupling and the flanges properly seated. A bolt should also be installed in this end to hold the shaft in place. The prop shaft should not be allowed to pivot or hang unsupported or damage to the end joints may occur. The viscous coupling contains an exact amount of silicone fluid to control the hump temperature point. It is serviceable only by replacement. It should be replaced if it's leaking. The torque shaft inside the torque tube has two serviceable ball type bearings and a seal ring. The torque tube does not contain a lubricant. The vacuum reservoir hoses, motor, solenoid assembly, and electrical harness are all serviceable components of the vacuum actuation system. Make sure the vacuum actuation system is correctly assembled. If the vacuum hoses are misrouted to either the vacuum motor or the solenoid assembly, the dog clutch could be incorrectly engaged and vehicle stability may be negatively affected. The dog clutch and shift fork are serviceable by replacement. The inner and outer race, seals, and sprague assembly of the overrunning clutch are all serviceable. Service to the rear carrier assembly is limited to the seals, seal joints, and the differential pinions and side gear. If the ring and pinion pinion shaft bearings, differential assembly case, or other internal components fail, the entire unit must be replaced. Again, this limited serviceability is due to the difficulty of shim selection required for setting bearing preload and backlash. The rear half shafts are unique to the all-wheel drive system, but are similar to those on the front-wheel drive system. The rear half shafts are serviceable, the inner end is flanged. The outward end of the shaft is splined and inserted through the driving rear wheel hub. The outer CV joint to hub nut must be torqued to 180 foot-pounds, plus or minus 25 foot-pounds, and the castle lock and cotter pin properly installed to assure torque retention. Otherwise, bearing failure or loss of the rear wheel may occur. This is also the case for the front half shafts. Please refer to the 1991 minivan service manual for all of these procedures whenever you're servicing the all-wheel drive system.
In order for the all-wheel drive system to operate properly, it must be maintained. One of the most important maintenance steps is confirming proper lubrication levels. Components that require lubrication are the power transfer unit, overrunning clutch, and rear carrier. The power transfer unit is sealed from the transaxle and has its own sump. It uses 38.8 fluid ounces of SAE 80W90 gear lube. The fill plug is located on the end cover of the power transfer unit on the passenger side. The overrunning clutch uses 12.4 fluid ounces of Mopar automatic transmission fluid. The fill plug is located on the passenger side of the case. The rear carrier uses 64.2 fluid ounces of SAE 80W90 gear lube. The fill plug is on the rear of the case. Fluid levels of the all-wheel drive system components should be inspected periodically and should be within one quarter inch of the lower edge of the filler plug hole when checked on a level surface. Under normal service, there's no need to change the lubrication in any of the components and none of the driveline components have drain plugs. The hub unit three type front and rear wheel bearings do not require maintenance. CV joints in the front and rear half shafts can be serviced if required. CV joints on the propeller shaft cannot be serviced. They're part of the propeller shaft assembly and the entire unit should be replaced if the CV joints are faulty. When inspecting the all wheel drive components for proper lubricant levels, also inspect each component for evidence of leakage. To diagnose fluid leaks at the power transfer unit input shaft and right half shaft, two weep holes, referred to as A and B, are provided. These holes are located on the bottom of the assembly. If fluid is detected from either weep hole, seal replacement may be necessary. Do not attempt to repair the leak by sealing weep holes. They must be kept clear of sealants for proper seal operation and for inspection. If fluid is leaking from either weep hole, the type of fluid will determine the seal that may be leaking. And be sure to clean the surface around the weep holes so that you can correctly identify any leaks. If the fluid at weep hole A is red transmission fluid, the transaxle differential carrier seal may need replacement. If the fluid is light brown hypoid gear lube, the power transfer unit input shaft seal may be leaking. If the fluid at weep hole B is red transmission fluid, the input shaft end seal may require replacement. If the fluid is light brown hypoid gear lube, the half shaft inner seal and power transfer unit input shaft cover seal may be defective. Also, check the power transfer unit at the rear output shaft. If you find brown hypoid gear lube, the rear output shaft seal may be leaking. For replacement of these seals, refer to power transfer unit service procedures in the service manual. You should also check for leakage at the weep hole between the overrunning clutch housing and the rear carrier. If you find red transmission fluid at the weep hole, the sealed joint between the cases may require servicing. If you find brown hypoid gear lube at the weep hole, the rear carrier housing pinion shaft seals may be defective. That covers lubrication. Next, we'll go through the procedure for testing the dog clutch actuation system. Correct operation of the dog clutch vacuum actuation system is important to safe operation of the vehicle, since the dog clutch bypasses the overrunning clutch when the shift fork is engaged. As we said earlier, this is necessary to provide all-wheel drive in reverse. Whenever the dog clutch, overrunning clutch, or vacuum actuation system has been serviced, it is important to be sure it operates properly. To test the operation of the dog clutch actuation system, raise the vehicle so that all four wheels are free to turn. Have a helper start the engine and release the parking brake. 
Now apply the brakes and shift the transaxle into drive. Release the brakes and increase the RPM. All four wheels should turn in the forward direction. If the rear wheels do not turn, either the overrunning clutch was not installed, installed backwards, or the inner race is missing. Next, apply the brakes, bring all four wheels to a stop, shift into reverse, and release the brakes. Increase the RPM to turn the wheels in reverse. All four wheels should turn in reverse. If not, the dog clutch is not engaging. Now apply the brakes to stop the wheels from turning and put the shift selector into park. With the vehicle raised, manually turn both rear wheels in the forward direction. Remember, both wheels must be turned at the same time. The rear wheel should turn freely. If not, the dog clutch failed to disengage. If the system is not working properly, check for misrouted vacuum hoses to either the vacuum motor or the solenoid assembly. Also, check the solenoids for proper operation. Finally, check the dog clutch for jamming and check the overrunning clutch for missing components or improper installation. Be sure to refer to the service manual for more thorough diagnostics in this area. That was a pretty good overview of the new all-wheel drive system on the 1991 Chrysler minivan. We looked at system operation and components we covered the design changes necessary to incorporate the all-wheel drive system into the front-wheel drive minivan. Finally, we talked a little bit about servicing the all-wheel drive system. Well, that's it for this program. We'll see you next month on Master Tech. The service procedures detailed in this program involve two separate recalls of imported 1986 and 1987 vehicles. Recall 293T involves 1986 Dodge Ram 50 and Power Ram 50 vehicles equipped with a 2-liter carbureted engine and federal emission control system. Recall 294T involves 1986 and 1987 Plymouth and Dodge Colt Vista four-wheel drive vehicles, also equipped with a two-liter carbureted engine and federal emission control system. Vehicles involved in both recalls may emit hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide in excess of federal emission standards. To correct this condition, the carburetor primary and secondary air bleed jets and choke shaft must be cleaned. A carburetor choke adjustment shim must be installed to provide leaner choke operation, and the enrichment solenoid jet must be replaced. For repair of affected vehicles, emission service parts packages, part number C3940402, are being shipped free of charge to all involved dealers for recall 293T. And parts packages, part number C3940403, are being shipped free of charge for recall 294T. In addition to the parts package, the fast idle release tool, part number C3940272, which was distributed with emissions recall number 469, will also be required for this service procedure. Because of the similarities in the service procedures for both of these recalls, this videotape will demonstrate the procedure on Colt Vista models. Any differences between the two recalls will be explained as they occur in the procedural sequence. Unlike other recent recalls involving MMC imported vehicles, 
The carburetor does not need to be removed for service and installation of the choke shim and enrichment solenoid jet on Ram 50 models involved in recall 293T. This is due to better access on the carburetor. However, for Colt Vistas involved in recall 294T, the carburetor must be removed. To begin the service procedure for both recalls, first remove the air cleaner assembly. Next, for Colt Vista models in recall 294T, remove the carburetor following the applicable service manual procedures. For Ram 50 models in recall 293T, the carburetor will remain installed. With the carburetor on the bench for recall 294T or on the vehicle for recall 293T, clean the outside of the carburetor and the choke linkage with Mopar brake and carburetor cleaner, part number 4318037 or equivalent. Also clean the primary air bleed jet, secondary air bleed jet, and the choke shaft. After cleaning, check the choke for smooth operation and inspect the primary and secondary air bleed jets for any dirt. The next part of this procedure involves the installation of a carburetor choke adjustment shim. This part of the procedure can be performed with the carburetor on the engine for Ram 50 pickups. However, for Colt Vistas, the shim can only be installed with the carburetor on the bench. For Ram 50 pickups, with the carburetor still installed, first disconnect the brake booster vacuum line. Next, disconnect the throttle return spring. Now install the choke adjustment shim. For visual access, most of this procedure will be shown with the carburetor on the bench. However, the same procedure will apply with the carburetor installed. To install the shim, insert the fast idle release tool between the fast idle cam lever and the wax element housing and turn the tool counterclockwise about 45 degrees to provide a clearance between the choke adjusting screw and the plunger. Now using the installation stick attached to the choke adjustment shim, install the shim on the choke adjusting screw as shown here. Then rotate the fast idle release tool clockwise and remove it from the carburetor. Next, detach the installation stick from the shim by twisting the stick until it breaks free from the shim. Ensure that the choke adjustment shim remains securely installed between the plunger and the adjusting screw. For Ram 50 models in recall 293T, the same shim installation procedure can be used. The only difference is that the installation stick will be inserted from the driver's side of the vehicle as shown here. After installing the shim on Ram 50 models, reinstall the throttle return spring and brake booster vacuum line. The next part of this procedure involves the replacement of an enrichment solenoid jet. Again, this step applies to both recalls. For recall 293T, install the jet with the carburetor on the vehicle. And for recall 294T, install the jet with the carburetor on the bench. To do this, locate the enrichment solenoid valve on the carburetor directly above the accelerator pump housing and remove the valve. Next, remove and discard the enrichment solenoid jet and install a new enrichment solenoid jet from the emissions parts package. After installing the new jet, reinstall the enrichment solenoid valve and tighten it to 2.2 foot-pounds or 2.9 newton meters. Do not over-tighten the valve. Over-tightening will distort the valve and cause an over-rich condition. Next, for Colt Vistas involved in recall 294T, reinstall the carburetor following the applicable service manual procedure. 
Finally, for both recalls, reinstall the air cleaner assembly to complete these service procedures. Dealers are urged to give their full support to these important programs by serving all involved owners promptly and courteously. The EPA will audit these recalls. Failure to perform each step of the procedures as specified could subject affected dealers to significant fines. For further information regarding these service procedures, vehicle lists, repair parts, and claim reporting procedures, refer to the Dealer Emissions Recall Notification Letters, numbers 293T and 294T. The emissions recall detailed in this program involves 1987 model year Plymouth and Dodge Colt import vehicles equipped with a 1.5 liter carbureted engine and federal emission control system. These vehicles may emit carbon monoxide in excess of the federal emissions standards. To correct this condition, a vacuum control valve must be installed and the vacuum harness must be modified. For repair of affected vehicles, emissions service parts packages, part number C3940404, are being shipped free of charge to all involved dealers. To begin the service procedure, first locate the long white striped and red striped vacuum hoses, which are clipped together in the supplied vacuum harness, and connect them to the corresponding ports on the supplied vacuum control valve. Then, connect the blue striped hose from the harness to the remaining port on the valve. Now, locate and remove the vacuum line connecting the inboard port of the secondary air control solenoid and the secondary air control valve. For visual access, the radiator hose has been removed. Disconnect the remaining vacuum hose from the secondary air control solenoid front port and shorten it by four inches. Next, connect the shortened hose to the three-way connector, connecting the ends of the red and white striped hoses of the harness. Now, locate the short green and white striped lines of the harness, which are clipped together. Connect the white striped line to the front solenoid port, and connect the green striped line to the inboard solenoid port. Next, connect the remaining short green striped hose to the secondary air control valve. Now, remove the foam filter from the rear port of the secondary air control upper solenoid. After removing the filter, connect the long green striped hose of the harness to the exposed nipple. Next, locate the existing white striped hose, which connects to the blue four-way connector, and cut the hose two inches from the connector as shown here. Now, insert the T at the end of the long white striped hose of the harness into the cut ends of the hose. Next, locate the existing green striped hose connecting the carburetor and the vacuum switch, and cut the hose as shown here. For visual access, the air cleaner has been removed. Route the long green striped hose of the harness around the carburetor, then remove and discard the short piece of hose attached to the T at the end of the hose, and insert the harness T between the cut ends of the existing green striped hose. Next, secure the hose with the provided tie strap. The tie strap must be positioned, as shown here, to prevent interference with the carburetor. Now, attach the bracket from the parts package to the secondary air control valve with the provided bolt, and clip the vacuum control valve into the bracket, as shown here. Finally, locate and clean the existing hose routing label 
on the underside of the hood and attach the new hose routing label from the parts package to complete the service procedure. Dealers are urged to give their full support to this important program by serving all involved owners promptly and courteously. The EPA will audit this recall. Failure to perform each step of the procedure as specified could subject affected dealers to significant fines. For further information regarding this service procedure, vehicle lists, repair parts, and claim reporting procedures refer to the Dealer Emissions Recall Notification Letter, number 483.